Uh, hi. Hey, hello, everyone. <laughs> All right. Okay. So we uh, won't be breaking any records no, tonight. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So uh, I think that we can start. Okay. Um, first, I would like to thank you all for coming uh, uh, to uh, today's event uh, uh, online. Uh, I, uh, I see some familiar faces there. And I would like to thank uh, our live audience uh, as well. Uh, so uh, today is uh, a bit of bit, uh, a little bit of both. Uh, so okay, uh, I like to announce our today's speaker uh, uh, in the fall seminar of Science, uh, Faith, and Superstition project. Uh, and the project is funded by uh, Ian Ramsey Center for Science and Religion and Templeton Foundation. Uh, and our today's guest uh, is Dusenberry, uh, uh, about Plato and Dallin as well. Um, David is a senior fellow uh, at Danube Institute in Budapest. Uh, he's a philosopher, he's a historian uh, of ideas, uh, and he's the author of uh, uh, several books. Uh, one of them is on Nemesius of Amis, um, and uh, the other two are The Innocence of Pontius Pilate and uh, I Judge No One. Uh, all published by Oxford University Press. Uh, so, uh, David, uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you so much, uh, Professor Radenovich. It's such a pleasure to be here with all of you. So my thanks to you and your, uh, your project, Science, Faith, and Superstition. It's really a delight to uh, give the third lecture in the series. Uh, and I look forward to those to come. So uh, this evening we're talking, as you know, about Nemesius of Emesa. I'm going to read my remarks because I'm trying to trace out a rather tight argument. But I, I suppose I can begin by saying just a few words on Nemesius' significance. He writes at the very end of the fourth century, and he is clearly heir to an extremely long kind of um, both philosophical and medical tradition which we're going to be looking at today, how he uses both the philosophical and the medical tradition to find his way through a, a kind of a significant question regarding the fate of the soul. And um, I think one of the things that's notable about Nemesius, he writes what's commonly accepted to be the first Christian anthropology. It had a very significant reception history. It was being published in the late 17th century in Oxford as kind of a counter force to the rise of Cartesianism. Of course, Cartesianism carried the day, not Amesius, but nevertheless, I think that's a significant indication that very serious people in the early modern period uh, looked to Nemesius for some sort of guidance. And I suppose two things that might be interesting to some of you I can mention before we move into the topic proper. One is Nemesius is the first author of any kind we have on record who describes the distribution of cognitive functions in the brain. So basically what we would now call uh, for shorthand uh, brain mapping is first found in Nemesius text. And we know that Nemesius is not the source of this idea. Um, although in later kind of later tradition, he is one of the main sources um, that gives rise to what's called the cell theory of cognition in the Middle Ages and Renaissance and so on and so forth. Uh, but nevertheless, he was he was using the very best physiological texts of late antiquity, basically all of which, almost all of which have been lost. And um, that's going to be significant for us today on a number of different topics. He points to whole discourses surrounding, for instance, the topic of reincarnation, about which we basically have none of the relevant texts anymore. So I think it's salutary for us to remember both physiologically and philosophically that, that Amesius is a kind of prism. And there are a lot of discourses and textual traditions that pass through him and his sources are simply lost to us. The other thing, which is I think uh, not only interesting in terms of the history of science and medicine, 
but it's also relevant for our topic today, is he has an extremely uh, precise and compelling description of the circulation of the blood. And in the early 17th century, when William Harvey issued his kind of epic making description of the circulation of the blood, there were a number of humanists who said, oh, by the way, there was this Syrian bishop <laughs> who has a very nice description of the same phenomenon. So why this is relevant to our topic today is because as you will be hearing, Nemesius attaches a great deal of significance to the structure and the purpose of organs of the body. And he believes that there's a kind of metaphysical significance to this, which I think lends um, a kind of, uh, sheds light upon and le lends a special meaning to the fact that he was himself so interested in physiology and medicine. Uh, so the, uh, the structure of my remarks are on the screen and um, we will kind of be looking at Galen at a number of different points, but really very clearly concluding with him. And there will be some sections on both Plato and Aristotle. I know we have some Platonists and Aristotelians uh, here this evening. We can begin with uh, a very, very simple question. What happens to humans when they die? Uh, the question I, I should say is grammatically simple. It is not philosophically or psychologically simple. In the last book of his City of God, Augustine writes, if I wish to speak the truth, I find this frank conditional quite striking, if I wish to speak the truth. I do not know what eternal life will be like, for I've seen nothing of it by means of the bodily senses. Of course, St. Augustine's convictions about the Vita Aeterna are not confined to this confession of ignorance. The African philosopher bishop is by no means agnostic about the human soul's destiny. Yet there is more uncertainty in his writings and in the early Christian archive than many commentators have tended to recognize. In Dirk Krausmuller's recent contribution on Christian Platonism and the debate about the afterlife, he stresses early Christians who wished to know what would happen to them when they died, uh, the New Testament made rather frustrating reading. What is he claiming here? Well, the canonical edition of uh, early Christian writings that was made in the second or third century uh, into the New Testament spoke only about the future when human souls would be reunited with their resurrected bodies. The early church's most revered texts, he writes, Crossmuller writes, gave no information about the state in which human souls found themselves before the universal resurrection. Now, I think it's actually inexact to say there's no such information in the New Testament but the point Crossmuller is making is important. Christian conceptions of the afterlife are contested throughout the first centuries of our era, and indeed, in this 21st century, they still are. The writer of Luke Acts shows the Athenian council erupting in laughter, with the exception of the celebrated uh, Dionysius, whence pseudo-Dionysius, and a forgotten but I think a significant woman named Damaris, so the, uh, 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 the Athenian council bursts into laughter when Paul declares to them the idea of the resurrection of the dead. Later tradition reveals a surprising number of Christian homologues, however, between uh, uh, two Hellenistic and post-Hellenistic conceptions of the afterlife. So the contrast we see in Acts is not one that uh, survives indefinitely. For example, at the close of the fourth century, our man Amesius says this, I find this a really extraordinary uh, concession. Some say that Christians imagine the resurrection because of stoic theories of the reconstitution of all things. By the way, Amesius has a really tremendous, very beautiful description of how the stoics think of the reconstitution of all things. The, uh, the fact that Socrates and Plato will once again be living in Athens and so on. so forth, it's quite nice. The Athenian elites ridicule Paul belongs to a very early pension of the Christian kerygma as depicted in Acts, has given way to a different pagans. Such charges were leveled on all sides in the first century. But not all such similarities uh, between Christian and non-Christian conceptions of the afterlife were equally troubling. And one of the things I want to begin by saying is that the um, Plat Platonic and Manichaean myth, they shared a myth or theory of the afterlife, which I think was late antique Christianity's most unnerving homo 
monologue, but it's very rarely discussed in the literature, and that is reincarnation. Now, the idea of reincarnation, the myth of reincarnation runs in two different channels, one of which, as we see here, has been called metensomatosis by Pierre Fossel. Metensomatosis is the metamorphosis of human souls into the bodies of animals, which is contrasted with metempsychosis, in which a human soul passes to another human body after death. Now, this evening, I'm really focusing on metensomatosis, which is human to animal or non-human reincarnation, uh, because this is a theory that Nemesius critiques in, I think, a very interesting way. It's worth noting, though, before we go on, that there's no modern consensus about what, what Nemesius thought about human to human reincarnation, uh, 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 metempsychosis. In the early 20th century, Werner Jaeger concluded that Nemesius believed in human to human reincarnation, while this was later denied by Boleslav Domansky. I personally am inclined to agree with Domansky for reasons uh, which will be uh, indicated later on. Um, I don't think Nemesius did believe in human to human reincarnation, but there's nothing in my remarks tonight which really preclude that. And we're simply going to be asking how one Syrian uh, philosopher bishop who belongs to the Platonic Galenic tradition uses Galenic ideas, medical ideas, to refute a really founding Platonic and Manichaean myth, namely that of human to animal reincarnation. So let's begin just by looking at the very first sentence of Nemesius' um, first Christian anthropology, De Natura Hominis, which I'll call on human nature. I think three uh, things are happening in this first sentence. Many good men we read have held that humankind, and men, by the way, is um, is a, a, a term in Greek. Many good men have held that humankind is nobly constructed out of an intellectual soul and a body, indeed so finely that humans could not have been finally composed in any other way. The first thing that's interesting here is that this sentence introduces a theme of human nobility, which I think is more forcefully articulated in Nemesius texts than in any other patristic writing. Incidentally, during the Renaissance, the theme of human dignity was very clearly influenced by the reading of Nemesius. As we'll see in the coming moments, it is the idea of human nobility which determines Nemesius' critique of the myth of human to animal reincarnation. Second, Nemesius' very first sentence, sentence introduces a unique duplicity of substance, lucia, which constitutes the very core of his philosophical anthropology, as it will for uh, uh, later Christian uh, anthropology. Humankind is afforded several special properties and prerogatives in his text. It is only humans who laugh. It is only humans who repent, and so on. Uh, but duplicity of substance is the really uh, most salient ontological distinction. To be nobly constructed out of both an intellectual soul, a rational soul, and a body it is the differentia specifica of humankind. It is because of this that Nemesius believes we have been finally composed. In the third place, Nemesius' opening sentence introduces the basic postulate of his whole introduction uh, the whole introduction to his anthropology. It is because of this unique duplicity of substance that we occupy a singular place within a vast, harmonious, divinely ordered structure that Nemesius calls the world, topon and cosmos. So he very much believes in the idea of the, the microcosm, men, the microcosm, and men, the meeting point of all inert material and intelligent spiritual uh, uh, essences, which he lays out in a very quite significant way. There is some intimation of this larger conception of humankind in Nemesius' reference to the idea, which will be important for us this evening, that humans, as we see here, could not have been finally composed in any other way. That's going to be actually a very crucial part of his argument against reincarnation. Now, Nemesius strenuously denies that his deity is bound by fate, as we'll see, or by any other type of necessity. He regards creation and providence as luminous displays of divine freedom. Nevertheless, a certain kind of necessity attaches to his idea of the construction of human beings. It is in part this necessity which inspires his entire critique of reincarnation um, after... He reminds us 
that. This is a really significant sentence, I think, both for classicists, theologians, philosophers, all the Hellenes, all the pagans who declare the soul to be immortal holds to the dogma of re-embodiment. This was the defining myth for everyone in antiquity who believed, or all the, the Greek Greco-Roman pagans who believed in the immortality of the soul. Since the Mises agrees with those Hellenes who hold that the human is composed of an intellectual soul and a body, since he believes that this intellectual soul is immortal, since the immortality of the soul is held by all the Hellenes to sanction the archaic and platonic myth of reincarnation, that is a recurring incarnation of souls as a divine method of assigning rewards and punishments. And since the Mises does not himself hold to the dogma of re-embodiment, therefore it is extremely important for him to extricate his concept of immortality from the then very prevalent myth of reincarnation. The reasoning that Nemesius relies on to do this, the topic of my remarks this evening, um, are centered on chapter two of his text, which is uh, uh, centered on the immortality of the soul. But reincarnation figures at a number of different points in his uh, short anthropology. I think this is because this platonic Hellenic myth uh, tries to articulate the two domains which structure the first Christian anthropology from the very first sentence, namely that humanity, humans are given a nobly constructed body and that they are endowed with a soul which can incur guilt and therefore can receive divine rewards and punishments. As we will see, Nemesia's claim is that human to non-human reincarnation is incoherent precisely because, to his mind, it fails to harmonize a Galenic logic of the body, which is to say the innate nobility of the human body, and a Christian logic of divine reason and justice. So before we proceed further, we can just take our bearings. I think we can uh, begin by turning to the very last sentences of On Human Nature 4. This is Nemesius' chapter on the body qua body, and in a cursory way on the different parts of the body. I've already said parts of the body are going to be absolutely essential for our conclusion this evening. Here Nemesius refers with a sweeping gesture and a revealing aside to Aristotle's history of animals. This is Nemesius. He says, if there are those who wish to pursue this topic in real detail, let them read Aristotle on the history of animals. This reference occurs, as I've said, in the very last chapters, uh, very last sentences of this chapter on the body, in which Nemesius observes, as we see on the screen, that not all animals, this is also fundamental for his critique of human to non-human reincarnation, not all animals possess all parts of the body, but some lack certain parts, some have all and perfect, and could not have been finally composed in any other way. Now, sentence of his treatise at which we have just been looking. Nemesius concludes his chapter, but that has not been noted in uh, much of the literature. Nemesius concludes his chapter on the body by asserting that humankind could not have been finally composed in any other way. And he opens his entire treatise by asserting that humankind could not have been finally composed in any other way. This is not mere flourish. Um, this is, but this passage also points us to Aristotle's history of animals and indirectly to its companion piece on the parts of animals for Nemesia's conviction Uh, for Nemesius' conviction of the nobility of the human body owes much to the latter work, parts of animals. It is in Parts of Animals 4 that Aristotle writes that it must be incorrect to say, as some are saying, already in uh, fourth century for uh, Christ, that humankind is not finely composed. I don't think there's any need to labor the four echo here, which is also present in the Greek, of Nemesius' claims that uh, humankind is finally composed. So Aristotle seeks to demonstrate in uh, how so and propos, because its nature and essence is divine. It is in this pagan tradition that Nemesius stands when he draws the Christian conclusion that humans are tasked by the deity, the principle of human governance is signaled for Nemesius by the earthward prosgain posture of 
uh, living things which live only by natural impulse, whereas humans are capable of living by reason and thus their uh their heads uh face the skies okay more broadly why are we talking about aristotle parts of animals right now more broadly this reminds us that aristotle's path-breaking morphological investigations um are linked to investigations and concerns in what uh, the bishop Nemesius calls his ethical books. It is impossible for Aristotle or Nemesius to theorize body qua body or parts of the body totally without reference to questions of justice, as we just saw in History of Animals. Um, Nemesius' citation of Aristotle's History of Animals contains within it a reference to these other more far reaching as the myth of reincarnation. Before we get to reincarnation as such, though, I think it's illuminating to turn with Aristotle uh, in mind to Galen's treatise on the natural faculties. It is in this text of the marvelous, marvelous physician, as Nemesius calls him, that Galen boldly asserts that the question of the nobility of the human body generates the two sects which dominate the parallel histories of medicine and philosophy in antiquity, and I would argue, uh, in late modernity. According to the first sect, nature is more basic and more archaic than the primary bodies, which we would, of course, call atoms, and therefore it is a nature which composes the bodies of both plants and animals, which she does by virtue of certain powers which she possesses. This implies that nature acts throughout in a highly skilled and what? Just manner. This is what we were just discussing. The, the structure of the body is a reflection and an instantiation of justice. According to the second sect, there is no substance or power which belongs to nature or to the soul, but these result from the way in which the primary bodies collide. The inference drawn by Galen from this is that humankind is in possession of no innate or archaic ideas, whether of agreement or conflict, justice or injustice. So this is broadly speaking, the sort of Democritean and Epicurean uh, uh, world picture. What is of importance for us here is Galen's double linkage of the question of the human body's nobility and the question of demiurgic justice. If Galen's human body exhibits a highly skilled design, it is because the demiurge is just. But if the human body is an aleatoric, a chance effect of atomic collisions, then the idea of human and divine justice both collapse. It is by appealing to Galen's conception of demiurgic justice, namely that the human body is the work of a skilled worker who per perceives order and harmony, that Nemesius seeks to refute the Hellenic myth of human to animal reincarnation. Um, but that Nemesius returns to this myth in the very final chapter of his text shows that its significance is not only confined to some of the momentary tactical engagements at which we're going to be looking. Rather, I think, uh, this myth in some ways drives the Mesius argument even to the very end of his text. What we have here, by the way, I mentioned earlier that Nemesius uh, is the one of the primary sources for the theory that different cognitive functions occur in different parts of the brain. And this is Leonardo da Vinci setting this out on the basis of certain primitive experiments he carried out. But nevertheless, this is kind of one of the end points of the Nemesian tradition of uh, brain uh, uh, function and physiology. Since Nemesius' critique of the myth of human to non-human reincarnation turns upon his Galenic concept of justice as it is reflected in the human body, it is not out of place for us to turn now from on human nature four to the myth of reincarnation in on human nature two. The basic questions which concern us in the coming moments are first, whether the human body is uniquely fitted to receive a human soul, and secondly, whether the demiurge, the creator, the, the technician uh, 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 composite bodies, could unite a human soul and an inhuman body, even as a form of punishment. Because Nemesius affirms the first, relying on the Galenic tradition, uh, he denies the second diverging from the Platonic tradition. 
Amesius claims that the myth of human to animal reincarnation violates the rational limits of divine punishment and therefore is not true. It is a certain kind of intuition of justice that actually structures his medical and physiological arguments. It is crucial for us to recall that reincarnation is the definitive uh, Hellenic myth of the judgment of the dead. In the Mises milieu, we often forget this. Patrologists often forget this. In the late fourth century, the judgment of immortal souls after the deaths of one of their bodies takes a form that he calls re-embodiment, metensomatosis, but that other late antique Platonists call rebirth, palingenesia. In an excursus whose structural significance for Nemesius has not really been recognized, Nemesius says, as we've already heard, that all the Greeks who declare the soul to be immortal hold to the dogma of re-embodiment. Before we examine Nemesius' treatment of this dogma, we should note the significance it has for him in his own words in the final pages of his text where he writes this, that the soul is not mortal and that human destiny is not bounded by this present life is shown by the fact that the wisest of the Hellenes believe in re-embodiment. That is, the positions allotted to souls for the life each has lived and the punishments of souls with which each is punished in exact measure. This dogma, if defective in other regards, still confesses with us, namely Christians, that the soul survives after this life and that the soul Justice is precisely a Greek myth or dogma or theory which validates for him the Christian belief that the human soul survives death as a legal person, as an entity who can be rewarded or, or, or human souls, is a dogma that the Syrian bishop holds in common with the wisest of the pagans, namely Platonists. In contrast to, as I've already mentioned, the Epicureans who imagine, in Amesius' words, that the soul and body suffer dissolution together. Reason that Amesius commends the Hellenes, the pagans, by means of this myth, they have preserved a concept of uh, justice for souls in the afterlife. In on human nature, however, it is precisely the bodily aspect of the myth that Nemesius will object to. Now, Nemesius writes in Human Nature 1 that repentance is a human prerogative which is held by every human and forever throughout their lifetime in this world, but no longer after death. Um, it could be inferred from this idea that one can only be judged once, uh, that he would reject the myth of reincarnation on the strength of this remark problematic for him. But this is really not the bishop's objection to the myth of uh, human to animal reincarnation. Rather, Nemesius objects that the embodiment of human souls in non-human bodies would constitute, quote, a reproach to God who provided an inharmonious body for the soul, since that is not the work of a skilled worker. In this way, Nemesius links the question of the human body's nobility to the question of a justice that is at once natural and divine, natural because divine. The context for this linkage is the Mesius Precy of the Genesis book of uh, Platonic natural philosophy, namely Plato's Timaeus. In his Precy of the Timaeus, the Mesius introduces questions to which he promises to return in the last chapters of his text. These matters, uh, he says, will be discussed in our treatment of faith, fate. And fortunately, this is a promise he keeps. There are many other such promises he does not keep, which is one reason why we know that his text is not finished. In the later passage, Nemesius concludes that Plato's world picture, quote, differs only slightly from the divine oracles, by which he means the, uh, the Christian scriptures, the Hebrew and uh, the Christian scriptures. What then is Plato's world on Nemesius telling? And how is the myth of re-embodiment, which Nemesius rejects, factored into it? First, we can read his account of the Platonic world picture. Plato declares that souls are both one and many. For the soul, which I capitalized here, that obviously means the world's soul. For the soul of the world is one, 
but there are also souls of particular things. Plato says that everything is alive, but not everything is an animal. For the Platonists distinguish plants from lifeless things by their growth and nourishment. I want to make one little note here. See the reference to plants. Nemesius has a very interesting account, an extremely interesting account of how plants can rise in the phyla to such a point that they are sensitive. They're basically animals. And then he has another very interesting account how animals can rise to such a level that they're basically intelligent. They're not quite intelligent, but they're, they're right on the verge of intelligence. Similarly, plants can be right on the verge of being animals, according to Nemesius. Some of the early testimonies we have to reincarnation, one of which is Empedocles. Empedocles says he was not only different kinds of animals and he was a girl and so on and so forth, he has been a plant. And we find this in other references to reincarnation. I find it actually interesting that there's no reference to reincarnation as a plant in, uh, in Amesius. I kind of wish he had touched on that topic, but he does not. Okay. Um, they say that the soul which steers the world sends out the particular souls which were produced earlier by the Demiurge, since clearly the Demiurge himself has given both the soul the world soul laws in accordance with which it must control all things, which play, the, the, this, uh, the, these laws are what Plato calls fate, and the Demiurge also provides a sufficient power to watch over us. What does he mean here? He means that there's a platonic theory of providence, which he regards as very important. Nemesius' basic objection to this world picture is that Plato's world soul is, as Nemesius sees it, bound by laws in accordance with which it must con control the world. Nemesius breaks decisively with this doctrine, insisting that his God does nothing by the necessity of nature or by the dictate of law. I think since uh, Professor Radenovich's project is concerned not only with late antiquity, but early modernity, I think there are some kind of four echoes of occasionalism, which we can find in certain of uh, Nemesius' formulations, early modern occasionalism. This uh, last divergence bears materially on the myth of human to inhuman, non-human reincarnation in a way that Nemesius himself does not articulate. For in Plato's world, such reincarnation would be a form of divine judgment, which would be inflicted, how? By the dictative law. Above the world's soul and above the demiurge stands some sort of law. In Nemesius' world, however, this could only be a form of judgment which would be inflicted by the hand of God in its absolute freedom. Since this form of judgment cannot, according to Nemesius, be reconciled with a conception of justice, as we will see in just a moment, the Platonic myth of reincarnation is held to be impossible within Nemesius' world. Nemesius is inclined to believe, however, that the Platonic myth of uh, human to non-human reincarnation is not in fact um, and we're about to see another one, but Nemesius is not entirely committed as a Platonist to a literal uh, uh, interpretation of Plato. What then is the bishop's account of the Platonic myth of reincarnation? Okay, we've already heard a, a few times really that all the pagans in common who declare the soul to be immortal hold to the dogma of re embodiment. Plato is no exception. This this is what Nemesius reports. Plato said that fierce and greedy souls take in exchange the bodies of wolves and lions. Those that were given to self-indulgence assume the bodies of asses and the like. Some understood this literally to mean lions and asses, while others discern that Plato had spoken metaphorically, so obliquely referring to habits via beasts. So you come back as someone who lives as uh, a beast of burden or as a predator rather than coming back as a beast of burden or a predator. Uh, so I, I, I began by mentioning how many lost texts Nemesius alludes to, and I'm about to point you to some of them, and it's really a shame these books are lost. Nemesius cites a second century Neo-Pythagorean philosopher, Cronius, who interpreted Plato's reincarnation myth quite literally in a lost treatise on rebirth. According to Cronius, the souls of beasts are neither non-human, the souls of animals are neither non-human nor irrational. Cronius said all souls are rational. And this, this shows up in some of the early testimonia 
which are linked to the idea of reincarnation. I believe it was Pythagoras who tried to intervene on behalf of an animal who was being led to slaughter because he said he recognized in the animal the soul of one of his friends. So this is uh, Cronius maintaining this position that the souls of animals are rational, as are the souls of humans. Amesius then cites a lost treatise by Theodorus of Asine, in which a uh, another Syrian writer, in which a literalist reading um, of Plato's reincarnation myth leads to the conclusion, quote, that the soul is the totality of forms. This rather singular accumulation of references to lost philosophical treatises may indicate that the question of platonic reincarnation held a special interest for our man. Without firmly committing himself on the question of interpretation, I've already said he sort of uh, is uncertain whether Plato should be interpreted literally or not. Nemesius inclines towards a metaphorical reading of reincarnation in Plato's corpus, and he appeals for such uh, um, to a Syrian Platonist, Iamblichus, whose family actually hailed from Emesa. So Nemesius is the bishop philosopher of Emesa. Iamblichus' family uh, were uh, in the generations before him, the priest kings of Emesa, which is now the city of Homs in Syria. Uh, so Nemesius appeals to the Syrian Platonist Iamblichus, who presented an ethical, not a literal, an ethical interpretation of reincarnation in yet another lost monograph. Nemesius gives Iamblichus' title as, in part, it's a very long title, this is part of the title, uh, that re-embodiment Re-embodiments do not occur from humans into irrational animals or from irrational animals into humans. Writes Nemesius, Iamblichus seems to me to have discerned better not only Plato's meaning, but also the truth itself, as can be established by many diverse proofs. Nemesius agrees with Iamblichus that re-embodiments do not occur from humans into irrational animals, but his critique but in his critique of reincarnation, there is no further mention of either Plato or of Iamblichus. Um, it is reasonable to infer that Nemesius is not concerned with what he calls here, uh, or in the, in the text I just read, Plato's meaning, um, whether it is literally or metaphorically interpreted. Rather, he is concerned with what he calls the truth itself of the myth of reincarnation. As we have seen, the truth of the Hellenic judgment myth uh, reflected in reincarnation lies in the fact that the soul survives after this life and undergoes justice for its transgression. This is what Nemesius recognizes as the truth of reincarnation. For him, its falsity lies in the suggestion that justice could be done by the demiurge uniting a human soul and a non-human body. The union of a human soul and a non-human body could not conceivably be just, according to Nemesius, even as a form of extreme punishment, because only the human body is fitted to receive the human soul. Nemesius' demonstration of this in On Human Nature 2 can be correlated with three theses, which I've taken from a much later chapter, On Human Nature 41, towards the end of his treatise. The Hellenic and Manichaean myth of human to animal reincarnation contravenes all three of these theses, theses and it is thus uh, predictable that he would uh, reject the, uh, the myth of reincarnation, myth or theory. The first thesis is that in the beginning, all rational natures were nobly created. In On Human Nature, chapter two, the divinity of a rational soul being united with the body of a non-rational animal. Since rational ability would be for it totally useless. The definition in literature, one thinks of it, Apuleius, all inhabiting an irrational animal's body. But anyway, um, the definition of demiurgic justice is that nothing was produced by God that was superfluous, and Nemesius adds that all confess this with one voice. So even those who hold to the myth of reincarnation would say that God doesn't produce anything superfluously. They just fail to draw the conclusion that Nemesius himself draws. Superfluity could never be the mark of a divine demiurge, or for that matter, 
of a human demiurge who perceives order and harmony to provide an inharmonious body for a soul even as a form of punishment would necessarily signal some sort of incompetence or injustice therefore for nemesius it is not a possibility second we were born autonomous and i think there's actually a rather significant line i think a line can be drawn like by way of texts and sources through medieval scholasticism early modern protestant scholasticism all the way to immanuel kant kant is talking about god freedom and immortality at the end of the 18th century and i think kant is in many ways kind of the last scholastic standing in line with with the cappadocians and amesius saying against many forms of ancient and late modern philosophy that humans possess freedom we are born autonomous human autonomy is a really salient theme in Amesius' whole text and in his critique of reincarnation. Although, as I've already mentioned, he praises in great detail and with extraordinary uh, descriptive power, the resourcefulness of animals to which he ascribes an image of skill and a shadow of reason. He says some animals possess a shadow of reason. He talks about uh, crows as being especially intelligent and the latest Scientific literature confirms this, that crows are an extremely intelligent species. Um, Nemesius, nevertheless, they possess a shadow of reason. Nevertheless, Nemesius says that each species of a rational animal moves in accordance with its own, namely the species impulse, with the result that the whole species is moved by a single impulse. This is, a, of course, contestable. It is in contrast to this that Nemesius asserts that humans, human acts take a thousand different routes. He takes human variegation as a sign that we possess reason, and that reason is, quote, something free and autonomous. Nemesius marks reason's appearance in the world by shifting his descriptive terminology from kinesis, movement, to praxis, act, where instinct uh, moves, reason acts. And this is still reflected when we talk about behaviorism, right? You're not talking about entities who freely act. Um, where in, uh, uh, to unite a rational soul to a body belonging to an irrational species would be to annihilate the soul's capacity to act. Why? Because I've already said, for Nemesius, there is a certain part of the human brain which makes rational the rational soul capable of utilizing the body in a rational way. And humans are the only species, according to him, who have this structure in the brain. Okay, so uh, human to non-human, uh, reincarnation would contradict Nemesius' unshakable conviction that the human soul is born autonomous. The third basic thesis, we become bad by our choice, not by nature. Nemesius rejects the myth of reincarnation in part because it conflicts with his idea of human innocence before the fall. If the uh, Greco-Roman myth of human to animal reincarnation wishes us to believe that theory of morphments for wickedness. Committed in quote, human lives. So it's something humans do in a human life that leads cast into the first bodies of animals that came. These souls, the souls cast into the first animals, the rational souls cast into the very first animals must have been bad by nature rather than bad by choice. The Hellenic and Manichaean myth therefore contradicts the very principle of justice, which must be upheld if the world, according to Nemesius, is to have been created by a just deity. It is notable, though, that the decisive uh, thesis in Nemesius' critique of human to animal reincarnation is not derived from a prophetic text. It's not derived from the Hebrew or Christian scriptures, nor is it derived from a platonic dialogue or from another church father. It is derived from the medical corpus of Galen, which brings us to our conclusion. It is in his paragraphs on reincarnation that Nemesius cites Galen's use of parts, commenting that the marvelous physician seems to hold this view. Nemesius is a subtle commentator. We've already heard when he's writing about Iamblichus' interpretation of Plato. He says he seems to take this position. Similarly here, he is a, uh, a nuanced interpreter of Galen. Galen seems to conclude that human souls could not be uh, 
united to human non-human bodies because so Nemesius draws this inference because Galen seems to conclude that for each species of animal there is a different species of soul it is in the same context discussing Galen and reincarnation and the uh, the the uh, different species of soul that Nemesius re returns to a Galenic organizing principle uh, obtained uh, which he, with which he effectively opens his text, the first Christian anthropology, namely body is the instrument of soul. And of course, instrument, the Greek word is simply organon. The body is an organ of the soul. Since a first principle obtained by reason and observation is that in Galen's words, the soul has use for all parts of the body. There's no superfluity. We've already established that. And since a non-human body would be, in Amesius' words, totally useless for a human soul, the Christian desire for justice or the pagan desire for justice should not lead us to accept the myth of human to animal reincarnation. On the contrary, it is precisely the Christian desire for justice which, according to Amesius, citing Galen, it is the desire for justice which conflicts with the myth of human to animal reincarnation. For this would violate the limits of punishment, for it would violate the limits of punishment for the demiurge to unite an intellectual soul to a non-human body. In this way, a rather interesting and significant uh, Syrian philosopher bishop who belongs to the Platonic Hellenic tradition, you uses a set of Galenic arguments and observations to critique the Platonic and Manichaean myth of human to animal reincarnation, which on philosophical grounds, he dogmatically rejects. Thank you. If anybody has a question, uh, just raise a hand. Oh, okay. Uh, hi, thank you very much, uh, David. That was a really interesting talk and a lot of things which I've touched on, I remember reading in, in the Mysticus and wondering how much of these uh, background sources is he drawing from like Galen. Um, and just on that on that note from your last, uh, I think your last slide, your last point, um, uh, it, it seems like a very Aristotelian thesis uh, that he's going back to, I guess this is at least through Galen, um, about basically the impossibility of having a soul to a different species of animal body versus human body because the soul basically determines the form. And so I guess I'm wondering with Nemesius, how much um, of that is he really just solely drawing from Galen and maybe just Galen himself is going back more to Aristotle's direction? And how much do you think is it possible that Nemesius is drawing from uh, and maybe Aristotle or an Aristotelian commentator? About that and how how Aristotle is is his uh, kind of turn there. I'd just be curious to get your impressions. No, thanks so much, Jonathan. That's a that's a really uh, interesting question. And since I limit myself to the Galenic source for these arguments, is because Nemesius himself does, and um, I, I think there's there's a certain point in uh, scholarship where it's actually kind of helpful to just uh, limit yourself to what we can establish. Um, and, and and certainly in the 19th century work on Nemesius, there was a lot of speculation, right? There was a lot of source critical speculation, which I, in a sense, wanted to get away from. But the question you ask is, is, is really interesting. Um, and I think I would just say two things in reply. One is, of course, the fact that he explicitly refers us to the history of animals suggests 
and, and there are actually passages in media where it indicates a direct knowledge of Aristotle. So he indicates it might be mediated through commentators, but he indicates some sort of direct knowledge. So it it, it, it is not in any way a sort of um, wildly speculative um, argument to make if one wanted to make it. And I suppose the, the second thought which occurs to me, which I do not make anywhere in uh, anything I've written on Nemesius, so it's quite an interesting one, is that Aristotle, the Nicomachean ethics are extremely and, and definitely expressly important at the very end of On Human Nature, where his arguments about human freedom are clearly drawing on uh, human freedom is kind of his architectonic concern. And if Aristotle's uh, kind of work on human freedom is definitely fundamental for Nemesius, then that would make it not only more reasonable, but also more interesting if Ar Aristotle is also a source for um, his critique of reincarnation, which kind of turn turns in indirect and complicated ways on the idea of freedom. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, I, I know I'm kind of my questions are kind of taking a bit maybe further from your focus, which is. Uh, Track from that, um, but just with the point of connecting. So, how much maybe uh, Nemesius is also using the, the the kind of anti-Stoic response against, ironically, the Platonists who maybe draw in that direction. But I'm I'm kind of thinking out loud and wondering out, out loud, and you don't have to answer it, but just it's something I was kind of curious about too. But. Uh, So, I mean, I think I think his I'm afraid I'm afraid you broke broke up you broke up quite a bit there um oh okay so can you still hear there. can you can you still hear me now yeah but i i guess all i would say is um i mean the the kind of relevance of alexander's commentaries um to the last chapters of nemesius are, are, are pretty non-controversial and but so my own treatment of the question of reincarnation which we were looking at tonight was really kind of focused on where Nemesius is discussing this question expressly uh, for the most part. And, and again, as I pointed out, um, there are, are a number of references and the fact that there are a number of references has really not been picked up on by, by most of the commentators. So in a sense, my energies went to trying to analyze that and clarify it. Um, but if, as I was just saying, if Aristotle, who's also relevant in the later chapters on freedom is in the picture in his critique of reincarnation, then this would also make your question a very reasonable one that um, Alexander, some of his polemics would also potentially be relevant to the question of reincarnation. Mm -hmm. uh, Paul raised the past, Okay, uh, it, it, is it my turn? Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, th thanks, David. Um, it's always nice to see you again, and it's always nice to return to immortality, um, which is a very important issue. Um, your, uh, um, your presentation is specifically uh, exciting because you show the connectivity of Platonizing anthropology with the physical Aristotle and the Galenic uh, medical uh, anthropology. Uh, that's very, very important. And <clears throat> because that has been also, I, I think, very frequently overlooked in, in doing history of philosophy. Uh, a de I have a detailed question, and that is, what is the Greek word for justice in Aristotle and in Galen? Be and my, my reason to ask for that is, it looks to me like Nemesius is using the term that is for, for justice and probably decay, 
um, which can mean simply orderly um, ass assembly of things and and transfers that into the notion of of moral uh, justice but may maybe i'm wrong so the 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 question is what is the 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 term for justice in the uh, um that is that is an excellent question and um i am having to turn to um i'm having to turn to my book i actually don't have an easy on hand by the way richard what a pleasure to see you uh, we were well. Richard was both a uh, a mentor, but also a colleague uh, halfway across the world uh, a few years ago. So, uh, an old friend. Thank you so much for joining us, and uh, for this wonderful question. Yes, I believe um, I am not seeing in my um, in my parentheses here. Okay, well, yes, Nemesius uses uh, decos for justice when he's talking about. He, and this whole undergoes justice dikos for its transgressions. Um, and I think dikaios is the term used um, at a number of different points, dk, dikaios. Um, whether, so the question you're raising is whether Galen is using the term in kind of the strict legal sense of punishments and rewards, or whether he's using it in kind of a, 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 a more capacious sense of um, the order of nature and so on and so forth. I mean, I. I do think that um, this is a great question, and I would have to go back to Nemesius and his sources with this question in mind. But I think that in most of the passages I read, including from from Galen, there is um, so when Nemesius talks about how this would not be what I call just for the demiurge to do, he also uses phrases like it would not be fitting and harmonious, it would not be the work of a, a, a craftsman who understood what was proper. And similarly, when Galen is talking about the two sects, um, he he kind of heaps up the descriptors. So we have, he says, we, we humans would have no idea of agreement or conflict, division or synthesis, uh, justice or injustice. And I, yeah, here I do have that note. That's udikayon uk adikon. So the, the, uh, th this is uh, Galen's terminology. and. I suppose um, it, 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 so again, uh, Galen says um, that the, um, the Demiurge positively, so I've just read his kind of negative description that um, for an Epicurean, the Demiurge is not acting according to justice or injustice. Whereas positively Galen says that he believes the Demiurge is being made, but they're purely synonyms, right? But I suppose, perhaps for, you know, uh, for obvious reasons, I would want to argue that precisely because the other kind of connotations of the word DK, which you're pointing to, because those are rep represent, or it's not unreasonable for us to um, kind of skew the reading of the chaos um, and, and, and so on and so forth. DK, um, but but even in, I, I would certainly say that's the case for Nemesius' citation of these sources. So in a sense, whether that's what Galen meant is a separate question from whether that's how Nemesius is reading Galen. Um, but, but I would also just add that when um, when there, there's a really beautiful formulation, the Greek for which I don't have on hand. But when Nemesius comes around to the question of freedom and providence, he says, look, in the end, everything receives a fitting settlement. And I don't recall the Greek term for what fitting is, but the settlement, the word for settlement is related to, for, to DK and the legal process. And so I think the, the idea of justice and fittingness, as you were saying, they go together. And so I think generally speaking, um, it would be more, or a question of wanting to, rather than excluding justice when we speak of fittingness and harmony and propriety and so on and so forth. Wonderful. Thanks.
Okay. Do we have any more uh, questions from the uh, audience online? If yeah, not, do, oh, no. Yeah. Is there any? Really well, maybe. Or bad. So uh, maybe we can uh, move to the questions uh, from the audience uh, in real life. Uh, do you hear me? Maybe, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let me just check. Okay. So any questions from the audience? Okay, Gastko, hi. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes, I do. Yes, uh, obviously I want to thank David for a, wonder mm -hmm. for a wonder wonderful talk. And uh, um, I was wondering, obviously I don't know about enough about Nemesius, but I was wondering if you would agree that these arguments uh, against reincarnation of the soul into the bodies of animals actually all hinge, depend, on the nobility of the human body and the human soul. Because if if that is the case, then uh, it seems to me that uh, we need to explain the fact, the fact of the nobility. And this is hardly, hardly explained naturally. So it seems to me that actually these arguments all depend on the nobility of uh, the creator's intention, that is God's nobility. So, I mean, this is the question. Do you agree that uh, arguments against the reincarnation into animal bodies actually depend on the nobility of the God's uh, work, workings? No, I absolutely agree with that. Um, and I guess I would say that, um, so rather than answering for myself, I'll just try to answer from what I take to be Nemesius perspective. So I, I, I began by saying that he opens his text with this really extraordinary discourse on human dignity, which is of course connected to nobility. And um, I also mentioned that he lays out the gradations of being, which unites sort of elemental being, material being, plant life, which as I said, at its highest levels verges on sensitivity, animal life, which at its highest levels verges on intelligence, and then human nature. And so I think he would, even though the kind of the axiom that um, the demiurge cannot behave ignobly or unjustly by uniting a noble soul to an ignoble body, this axiom is, is, is clearly, you know, what he would call theological um, or first philosophical, it's metaphysical. But I think he at least tries to begin by showing rather than simply asserting, he begins by trying to show that humankind has certain properties which distinguish its, the, our species distinguishes itself within nature from all other species. And so he begins by saying an intellectual soul is united to a body, but then actually he immediately says, it's a very interesting move. He immediately says, I'm writing an anthropology and not all humans would agree that we have an intellectual soul, a reasonable soul, a soul endowed, endowed with some higher power. So he says, look, this is not a starting point to write an anthropology, which a lot of humans would disagree with. So we have to begin with a different starting point. And he says, everyone agrees in antiquity, everyone did, that we have a soul and a body and that the soul is somehow superior to the body which is different from it being noble. He said it's, he says it's more powerful. And then he says, well, okay, what does it mean for the soul to be more powerful? And he says, the great proof of this, which all humans can confess is that what, when the soul, however you define soul, the Epicureans define soul as some sort of, you know, some sort of vibrant elan, which when at death kind of dissipates like smoke or, or, or fog in, into the atmosphere. But even if, if you define it that way, when the soul, whatever it is, leaves the body, the body ceases to function. The body no longer uh, has its kind of um, uh, any of its internal or external powers. And so he says a materialist can perfectly well agree that the soul is superior in the sense of the body. 
whatever we mean by talking of the soul, if you lack it, you're, you're a different kind of entity and you're a self-evidently lesser kind of entity, whatever, of course. And so, so it, he, it, and it's after making this move that he then says, well, what kind of soul do we have? And then he lays out his kind of um, natur philo uh, philosophische account, which I think, you know, actually, I, I know some of these uh, references might seem a bit wild. Uh, uh, Professor Bloom could confirm that some of this is relevant to Renaissance philosophy, uh, which he knows uh, exhaustively. But I think some of this is all also relevant even to German idealism, um, in fact, tries to then show that there are these kind of up the chain of being for the, the, the scala naturae and that we exhibit powers. Um, he talks about, I mean, I actually, in my book, I say, perhaps I could read a, a, a paragraph from Nemesius because I say this is, this is an interesting text um, a philosophically interesting text, which I think is relevant to your question, but it reads differently in the early 21st century, um, which many would call the uh, the Anthropocene or the Machinocene. Um, but one could argue in a sense that reading this in the Machinocene or the Anthropocene um, confirms exactly what Nemesius is saying, which is that we have some extraordinary power as a species, which we can, because we are free, we can turn in good directions or, or ill. So this is Nemesius, which I think gets picked up in the Renaissance uh, discourse of the dignity of man. This is long before I was discussing with Pro Professor Rodinovich yesterday, uh, the cosmonauts. This is long before space travel, but Nemesius says humankind is so sovereign over the heavens. What he means is that we can actually, we can make sense of the relations between the stars and we can observe the, uh, uh, the, 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 the motions and the dimensions of the constellations. Humankind is sovereign over the heavens, surpasses all principalities and powers. What does this mean? He's not talking about sort of like angels and demons. He actually has a rather sophisticated theory of animal cities. He says animals, we are not the only we are the only political animal in the strict sense that we have freedom and therefore we have laws which are passed by reason. But he says animals have extremely complex forms of collective behavior too, over which already in the fourth century and certainly in the 21st century, for better or ill, over which we are sovereign. We are sovereign over all principalities and powers. Who could express the advantages of this living thing? Humankind crosses the seas in contemplation enters the heavens, recognize as is the motions of the stars, their intervals and dimensions, harvests the earth and the seas, harvests and over harvests the earth and the seas, thinks, listen to this, thinks nothing of wild beasts and sea creatures. I don't have the Greek in front of me, unfortunately. Communicates by writing with those beyond the horizon, unimpeded by the body, rules all things, controls all things, and commands the whole creation. So he, he begins with human dignity, and he very much believes citing Genesis, the book of Genesis, that humankind has been set over the earth to rule it. And he says very clearly, he has a quite sophisticated uh, argument. He says, look, if we're supposed to rule it, and he cites, um, getting back to Jonathan Greg's question, he cites Aristotle. He says, then rule is a rational form that does not abuse those who are ruled. And so we have to treat, I, 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 we are bound in our treatment of low and he has this kind of a you know religious prophetic uh, truth he then i think tries to show to his satisfaction um how this is observably the case yeah. and then when I, I i'm sure you want to come back but i would make one last little point it's rather interesting because i said he proves to his own unsatisfaction that this is the case but one of the curious things about this text is that he says specifically that he's not only writing for christians he says also i'm not only writing for christians and pagans he says i'm writing this book for christians pagans and jews and um and so he draws part of the reason maybe he draws so much on pagan philosophy and medicine and 
um, polemically on Jewish lore and interpretations, kind of early rabbinic interpretations of, of the Old Testament and so on and so forth, is because he actually believed that the anthropology he was setting out could potentially basically convince everyone. Uh, no such luck, but uh, yeah. Uh, Okay, you said lots of things, but uh, let me try to simplify it. Simplify it. So uh, I don't uh, seem. I cannot see that uh, the 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 let's let's call it reincarnation into animal bodies reincarnation. Uh, I don't see it as being uh, precluded by anything if we don't accept divine ability. We could accept uh, the existence of the souls with its, with its capacities. <laughs> we could even accept that souls are better in some kind of way. But I don't see why uh, wouldn't soul kind of downgrade to lesser uh, lesser uh, kinds of bodies. For instance, a rational soul in, into a, a maggot's body or something like that. I don't see any reason for that mm -hmm. not to happen if we if if there is not an entity which uh, makes a correspondence between a perfect kind of body, a noble, uh, and an equal uh, or even more noble kind of soul, but there needs to be an external rational factor that is God. I, I, I don't see, I mean, you could, uh, you could say in theory that this is a brute fact of nature, but it seems kind of, um, kind of uh, too big of a coincidence. Like that, so uh, this was my, my point, I guess. If there is no some kind, if there is, no, you can even say tele teleology. If there is no no divine teleology, I cannot see uh, why 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 uh, shouldn't any kind of soul uh, just in another li life happen to be in any kind of body. Without without rational teleology, there seems to be more of a chaos. No, I mean, I think, um, so I tried to make clear that Nemesius himself, although he talks about different texts, so Plato and Galen, that really he kind of, and Iamblichus, he kind of concerns himself most with what he calls the truth itself of the matter. So he, he advances his argument, not at the textual interpretive level, but uh, by means of certain inferences and, and determinations and conclusions. And I... I have not, not myself kind of um, taken the time. I was I was at dinner just the other night with someone in Budapest who told me that um, she, you know, very very absolutely believes in reincarnation. Um, we didn't establish whether it was metempsychosis or metempsychosis, but um, but I mean, you know, this is a live question. The, it, there are major uh, religious traditions still which um, take the idea very seriously, and. Um, and I suppose it does, th th there are a number of moves um, which he makes, which um, you know, need not absolutely be made. So one of them, kind of a different move he makes, which I think would confirm your position that such a thing is conceivable. So he says that, um, or at least my reconstruction of Nemesius argues, that if some sort of fate is dictating laws to the supreme being, and this is one of the great primal questions of philosophical theology, I mean, getting back to Euthyphro, is, is there a principle above God or because of God, right? But if one accepts with the Platonic tradition that there's something above the divine, at least on Amesius reading, we can discuss this, but if there's something above the divine which kind of orders the divine's ordering of the world, then again, you could say that there's an older logic whereby these things are possible, but Mises says not only is God uh, wise, which Plato would very much affirm that God is wise, and, and I think Plato would affirm very much that God is good. Um, yeah, necessarily, indeed. Um, but, so, but that is the point, that one can affirm passionately and uh, 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 brilliantly that God is one and good and wise and so on and so forth, and still come to the conclusion that such a thing is possible. Whereas for Nemesius, because the one and the good and the true is also 
absolutely free, according to him, uh, it, it would be unthinkable. But I, I, I mean, I mean, I think um, one of the other things which is worth pointing out, Nemesius says his text is um, is just a notebook, basically. It's not a, he, he says, I don't even want to call this a treatise. It's just a notebook. I'm kind of making provisional arguments. And so I think a really exhaustive treatment of the question um, would raise a lot of these questions uh, and hopefully deal with them in interesting ways. But to my knowledge, this is one of the Nemesius, even though he is just a notebook, it's one of the most subtle treatments of the question of reincarnation that we have from that period. Thank you very much. I will read your book. Thank you. Hey, uh... Oh, there is another question, and we have just for one more, I think. One more, and then we should just wrap it up. I, I think I see uh, Vishnya raising hand. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, exceptional lecture. I would love to ask and to discuss a lot of stuff about Plato, and we can do this later because I have only one question. So I decided to um, to uh, ask you about one particular thing, which I find very interesting, which I thought of uh, during your lecture, uh, about the more contemporary uh, perspectives of the very perspective of Numesius, how I understand it. Namely, uh, 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 19th century Russian cosmism, which began with the philosopher, Christian philosopher Fyodorov, and also we have Tsiolkovsky, the father of the rocket science, etc. Uh, okay, I'm not an expert, but from what I gathered is that uh, the concept of the divine justice would imply our obligation to resurrect the body via medical science. I don't, I'm not sure whether he considered cloning and such an endeavor or uh, literally resurrecting the body. So I would like to hear your uh, comments on that uh, if you if you have some, because I, I found the parallel between the two, what would be the di divine justice? And on Plato, we can talk later. Oh, no, I stay here, yeah. No, thank you so much. So actually I was just introduced yesterday here in Belgrade by some of uh, some of the professors of the the, the faculty um, to two very interesting books um, one by Oxford the Russian cosmists and then I think the other by MIT press Russian cosmism yes. which I which I really I mean I, I want to read I'm very intrigued by this stuff um, but I literally heard of it yesterday although the Tchaikovsky I did know a bit about his work um, in the vaguest sense uh, before before our conversation yesterday. Um, but I think, I mean, I, I think it is fair to say that I am intrigued, I am wildly intrigued, and um, Nemesius doesn't really touch on um, anything I can think of that would be directly relevant to the, the, this idea of resurrecting the dead technologically or scientifically. Um, I think, I'm sorry, I think it has to do with perfecting the human body with this idea. Um, Moving in, what yeah. enables this perfecting is that uh, the body is not dead. There is, the body is never mm -hmm. dead. There is a continuum. So basically, this will be moving forward the idea of perfecting the human body. So let us, we have the means, the scientific means to create it so perfect that we can actually resurrect. Okay, so this uh, this makes sense. And uh, three, three thoughts. The first is in terms of nothing being dead. I mean, we already saw that according to Nemesius, Plato believed that everything is alive. Um, and Nemesius has some really rather nice descriptions uh, what we do when we drink, we have these various structures, some of which are purely elemental. So he says, basically, you know, the bones, the skeleton is elemental. And um, he also has a beautiful description of the uh, the gut, the abdomen. He says, is kind of, our, our whole nutritional system is plant-like, 
and our gut, our abdomen, is the earth from which the rest of the body, the plant, draws its sustenance, right? So that is that is the earth full of nutrients. So we're so on the one hand, I think this idea of the the continuity between the non-living and the living is something that he foreshadows in really kind of fascinating ways. I've already mentioned the idea of animal cities, which I find very suggestive, but that also confirms this kind of continuity theme. Um, the other thing I would say, or, or the second thing I would say, is that he, when he talks about the rise of the cities, and he believes very clearly that there can be no science and no art, no technology, no techne, without humans gathering together and living together. But he has a surprisingly positive account of the rise of cities. So there is actually a very sophisticated discourse. You look at, you know, Seneca's uh, 91st epistle on, um, you know, the rise of civilization. And it's pretty much as radical as like Rousseau's, um, you know, essay on the origins of arts and sciences. I mean, he basically says it is human corruption and mendacity and laziness and so forth that creates civilization. And um, so there's a very, very strong primitivist element in ancient philosophy and in ancient early Christianity. And um, who founds the first city in uh, Torah is the first murderer, right? Um, all of this is totally absent. And basically, Demesius has this very sort of late antique kind of progressivist. I mean, I don't think uh, I use that. There was an idealization of cultivation and culture present in figures like Libanius of Antioch, um, which Nemesius seems in a sense happy to, uh, to participate in and say, look, it's good that we have medicine. It's good that we live in conjunction with one another and we can derive greater wisdom and so on and so forth, undertake labor in a systematic way. So I think also, so there's this question of continuity. There's also the kind of um, valorization of the city. And... Um, and then, the th well, the, the third thing, which is really very interesting, is the twofold. Uh, the third point has two sides to it. The first is, he says, which kind of gets back to the previous question as well about human nobility. He says only humans, of course, this is not an empirical claim, but nevertheless, it's interesting. He says only humans have the dignity, the nobility of resurrection. Angels cannot repent, and angels have no bodies which will be given back to them humans have the capacity so this is the perfectibility of the body right a divine gift but he has this rather interesting interpretation i've already said that he's a subtle reader of the the old testament the torah the tanakh the pentateuch and when he reads the book of genesis he says that adam and eve were created what he calls potentially immortal and as i try to show in the book this potential immortality is not only an immortality of the soul, which is kind of how Philo construes it. There's another Syrian Christian writer, Theophilus of Antioch, who says that both the soul and the body were potentially immortal. And so this too, this idea of humans being given by God a potentially immortal body, even though Nemesius would say we lost it and we only get it back at the divine resurrection. So he's not, I hate to say, he's not a Russian cosmist. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, one could see how this idea of the, the potential immortality of the body, which is someone like Fyodorov. Fyodorov? Uh, it's, this is Tsiolkovsky's idea, but Fyodorov is the father of Kosky. He, he put the obligation for us to resurrect that the professor may be a better expert than me in, in the issue. It's, uh, oh, it's law, professor. I'm not an expert, but I read some of it. Okay, is it, is it, uh, it comes from? Well, Fyodor is it... also a whole story about the particles of bodies uh, from which uh, body can be basically reconstructed. Yeah. yeah, that too. So, so it's from in that sense, he yeah. thinks that uh, human bodies are really indestructible, even when reduced to the sort of basic elements, and that the science can, in the foreseeable future, reconstruct mm -hmm. the bodies. Mm -hmm. Even the, uh, the, the nature of these elementary particles. Mm -hmm. I mean, he doesn't see, say, genes or anything, mm -hmm. but you know, it's sort of an idea of that sort. Yeah. Well, well, 
to tie it all together, I think we can conclude with the thought that Nemesius, if he believed that humans could reconstruct human bodies like this um, for human souls to inhabit in the future, he would not want those human souls to be inhabiting artificially constructed animal bodies. I think he would not like that. Yeah. He would not like that idea. Okay, so uh, I think we are over time and we had uh, a lovely, uh, lively discussion. Uh, so uh, uh, I want to thank... Uh, Is there any other question? I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see it. Okay. Uh, Misha wanted the... Me, oh, Misha, I... I... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there will uh, be one more. Okay, okay. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes. Is it working? The magic? Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, yes, yes. It's okay. It's okay. Uh, <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt, but uh, at the end, you, you came to, to some things that are, let me say, more closer to what I'm uh, interested in, and especially introducing this uh, exchange uh, and ideas of what is conservative, uh, progressive for that time. Uh, and just to add one more dimension, I would like to hear uh, you upon that. Actually, uh, it, uh, Chantal Del Sol uh, published a fantastic book, very short, but really very useful for understanding what's really happening. Um, she, she was in March, our guest here in Belgrade also. Uh, the last book is uh, La Femme de la Chrétienité et Retour de Paganism, which is basically saying and trying to uh, uh, introduce us to understand actually that we are living, the, the basic argument says, okay, uh, since we are living post-Christian, post-religious uh, times, people have to believe in something, and she claims that actually we are returning more or less to the paganist tradition in many ways, including bioethics and so on and so on. And then she introduces this very interesting dimension, actually, that uh, for people living in the third century or fourth century after that, you know, you have a uh, uh, people like Seneca and uh, I mean the, the paganists who are were speaking about the uh, uh, corrosion, corruptiveness of this world that everything is declining and there were some Christians who were progressives and that's a time believing in the future and so on and which is very interesting to put within our contemporary sense when we Christians are kind of you know complaining we are living in the corrupted times and so well but but my, my question was since you were really presenting very nicely the time when uh, people were moving from uh, paganist philosophy understanding of the world to christian and this was really fantastic uh, let me say small uh, scholastic presentation of how people were trying to uh, preserve idea of immortality of soul and to transgress it, transform it into Christian way of living and so on. My question for you, and to, for, to, to, to finish with that, you know, uh, since you, you're deeply within this understanding and changing the um, uh, pictures of the world, uh, specific details of that, when you compare that, could we really uh, agree with Chantal that we are returning to uh, paganist tradition in, in understanding the way, do, do we believe uh, 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 in uh, immortality of the soul in Platonic world? We don't believe in anything. Do we believe, what, what do we believe in? In pure materialism or what you mentioned, your friend uh, who is believing really in some in something which I think still most of people believe in India. But mm -hmm. What do we believe at the, we at the West? Yeah, my friend is. Sorry. My friend is. Well, thank you so much. Uh, my friend is not a not a European, a Buddhist, um, and and she comes by her her faith uh, kind of uh, traditionally. Um, but but I've read a few essays derived from it, which are very powerful and you know learned and compelling and a bit uh, distressing. Um, as well, but I, I, I certainly would not diverge from her analysis. But getting back to kind of our earlier question about nobility, I do think that in a certain we we seem to be occupying a certain strange time in which basically we are almost almost formally and officially Epicureans, um, and yet 
we are kind of formally and officially committed to certain ideas of human nobility and, di and dignity, which do not necessarily sit well uh, with the Epicurean um, ethos, which I mean, I, I would say we're not even good Epicureans because the, you know, the, the, the real Epicureans were actually quite abstemious and so on and so forth. So we're sort of Epicureans in Malam partem um, in, in many respects. But I do worry very much that basically our um, our legal and cultural um, kind of deference to the idea of human nobility and dignity, which is, I believe, ultimately a kind of spiritual commitment. Um, I do worry that that will erode in time, and we will we will see um, uh, that um, that the undergirdings of that concept are no, no longer present and things which were thinkable. I was just reading today that, you know, the, uh, the, the, the games and the, the, the death sports in the arenas went on for, you know, many decades after they were first outlawed by Christian emperors. And so the, the time lapse was significant. And I think there'll be a significant time lapse now. And we're already away in, into that lapse, I think, but uh, the changes, changes are upon us so now uh i think that uh, uh as we are uh, uh over time uh, a lot uh we can uh end our session we uh, uh i want to thank david for the wonderful lecture and i want to thank uh, all of you for coming in real life and online um in our fall seminar we'll have a, a small break now. Uh, uh, we are coming back in uh, November with Jonathan Gregg, uh, but I'll keep you posted. So uh, stay tuned. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.